first, let me introduce our first speaker, Janice Evans. Janice has completed her BA and MST at Jesus College and is currently studying for her DPhil in English at St. Edmund Hall. She investigates pseudo histories in medieval Ireland and Wales and how their cultural authority was co-opted and transformed into the early modern period. Her focus is specifically on Geoffrey of Monmouth's De Gestis Britonum, on the deeds of the Britons, and on the book of the takings of Ireland. She is supervised by Dr. Mark Williams. And the title of her presentation today is King Arthur Tudor, Adapting and Co-opting Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, Monmouth in Wales and England. Janet. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dirk. I'll just uh, try and share my presentation again. Um, there we go. And then, um, is that showing correctly on the Zoom screen? Uh, yes, it is. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, so I will, yes, I'll just begin. So thank you very much for that, Dirk. And also, um, Thank you so much to Alexandra and Andrew for their talks this morning. Um, they were both really, really fascinating. So it was really great to hear from you both. Um, but yes, so uh, whenever we talk about King Arthur today, our minds may not immediately jump to Wales and Welsh history. So in my own ignorance, before I started my master's course last year and my DPhil this year, uh, whenever I thought of Arthur, I personally thought mostly of the BBC TV series, uh, Merlin. Um, but most people are familiar with the book The Once and Future King or perhaps Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur. Um, but perhaps as some of you already know, and there was lots of learned questions in the earlier session today, so maybe this is old hat to all you guys, but um, uh, the story of King Arthur actually originated from Welsh sources. Uh, Arthur is mentioned very briefly in some of the oldest surviving Welsh literature. Um, so uh, like the poetry of Taliesin or Aneirin, um, but he's a much more substantial figure in the Latin text called the Historia Britonum, um, which was produced in the court of the Kingdom of Gwynedd around the year uh, 828 AD. So in this text, Arthur is recorded as a leader of the Britons who defeated a Saxon army at the Battle of Baden, which was perhaps fought in the early sixth century AD. And King Arthur as many, if you're Welsh, you probably know it, is uh, featured in the fourth tale of the Welsh tales, the Mabinogion. Um, however, I'm not so interested today in talking about the so-called historical Arthur. Um, rather, I want to trace the story of how this historically shady King of the Britons um, was totally transformed into a mythical King of Britain. Um, more importantly, I want to ask how and why a story which was essentially part of ancient Welsh folklore became so important to the Tudor dynasty ascending to the English throne and to Elizabeth I herself. So the first part of the answer to this question, uh, as you may have guessed from the title of this talk, lies in one man's successful translation and adaptation of Arthurian material, Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, we know surprisingly little about his family origins and his life. He lived around the first half of the 12th century and he came from Monmouth, um, which is obviously bordering um, between England and Wales as a county that borders there. Um, this probably means that he wasn't actually a native Welshman, but he was instead a member of an Anglo-Norman elite. Um, these were essentially men who were planted along the border uh, by kings after the Battle of Hastings, so William the Conqueror or Henry I, um, so that they were on hand to help suppress potential Welsh rebellions across the border. So members uh, of this elite living in this area would become known as Lords of the Welsh March. Um, so we think Geoffrey was a member of this group because he had excellent Latin uh, and therefore must have had a top class education for the time. Uh, later in life, he then uh, was probably a canon at the Church of St. George in Oxford. So as Andrew mentioned in the first uh, session, we know that he worked and lived in Oxford for a while. Um, and then he became Bishop of St. Asaph in North Wales. 
So in other words, he was well connected enough to move in these kind of elite ecclesiastical social circles. Um, however, the rest of his life is a total mystery. Yet he wrote one of the most popular works in Latin to ever be produced in the Latin speaking West. The De Gestis Britonum, which translated means on the deeds of the Britons, but it's also known as the Historia Regum Britanniae, the history of the kings of Britain. Um, so to keep things simple and distinguish it from the Historia Britonum I mentioned earlier, I'll just refer to Geoffrey's work as the De Gestis Britonum or the De Gestis for the rest of this talk. So the De Gestis um, claims to be uh, a history of the ancient kings of Britain, and it begins with the illustrious story of Troy. It opens with Aeneas fleeing the burning city, um, and Aeneas, of course, is the protagonist of Virgil's Aeneid, the legendary founder of Rome. Um, and then it follows Aeneas's grandson, Brutus, who travels to Britain and becomes its first king. It goes on to trace each king or queen's reign of Britain in succession. There's a few um, queens who reign as solo monarchs in the story, which is quite cool, um, until the Saxon invasions of Britain. So King Arthur manages to beat back these Saxon invasions during his reign, but after he dies, or more accurately, is taken to the island of Avalon after being mortally wounded and he never returns, um, the Saxons overrun the island. And the text ends with the last king of the Britons, Cadwaladris, dying in Rome after sending his sons to Brittany in the year uh, 689 AD. So this endpoint in particular is highly suspicious. It's very conveniently around the same point when other historical works available to Geoffrey, like that of Bede or the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, start their own records. Um, and on a different side note, uh, the King Cadwaladris, who's the last king in the text, is the namesake of the Jesus College uh, Book Club Alumni Society, the Cadwalader Club, so it's a nice connection point there. Um, but yes, so Geoffrey claims the De Gestis wasn't an original work of his own, um, but that he merely translated it from a most ancient book in the British language, so that is to say Welsh. Uh, regardless, modern scholars are now certain that this ancient book was actually a total fabrication. In truth, Geoffrey made up basically everything in the De Gestis. In order to give it a veneer of validity, however, um, Geoffrey drew some names from Welsh sources, so like King Arthur, and also Merlin, who's synonymous with the Welsh prophetic figure Merlin. So Merthyn appears in works such as the, the conversation between Merthyn and Taliesin. Um, and oh, I thought I put it on the presentation, but I didn't. Um, but that's a 11th century text. Um, so yes, yeah, so this isn't to say that other people, um, especially historians, didn't notice that Geoffrey was basically lying through his teeth when he was writing this work. Um, for example, a 12th century author called William of Newborough who lived in the North Yorkshire coast, had this to say about Geoffrey's work. So um, since these events accord with the historical truth as expounded by the Venerable Bede, so these are the parts of the history he's just, uh, William has just talked about which he thinks are true because Geoffrey has taken them from Bede, but then he goes on to say about everything else. Um, it is clear that Geoffrey's entire narration about Arthur, his successors and his predecessors after Vortigern was invented partly by himself and partly by others. The motive was either an uncontrolled passion for lying, or secondly, a desire to please the Britons, so that's the Welsh, um, most of whom are considered to be so barbaric that they are said to be still awaiting the future coming of Arthur, being unwilling to entertain the fact of his death. So um, this is just one small quote. William of Newburgh rants for many pages about how inaccurate and uh, how bad Geoffrey is. So it was really difficult to just pick one thing out for this presentation. Um, but yeah, William really resents how popular uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth became. So despite this, um, there were apparently far more people who enjoyed the day guests than there were hateful William of Newburghs. Um, what helped him become so popular, and what was so important for the co-opting of the Arthurian story in the early modern period, uh, was the fact that he wrote in Latin, 
The material I mentioned briefly at the beginning, uh, the poetry of Taliesin, Aneirin's uh, E. Godolvin, as well as the fourth tale of Mabinogion, uh, these were all written in Welsh. The Historia Britonum was an exception and was written in Latin, and was also the first text which introduced Brutus, that's the grandson of Aeneas, um, as the eponymous ancestor of the Britons, um, as well as mentioning Arthur. But of course, the overwhelming popularity of the De Gestis compared with the Historia Britonum meant it was far more readily available as a copy um, after the 12th century. So this was mainly because Geoffrey had access to important ears in the royal court at this time, and therefore a direct route into the wider Latin speaking world. The man he dedicated his work to, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, uh, was the illegitimate son of the recently deceased King Henry I. And he was supporting Empress Matilda in the civil war against King Stephen. So a very important figure at that time. Um, modern scholars have also shown that Robert was instrumental in disseminating the De Gestis on the European continent and therefore boosted its overall popularity in a really significant way. Um, Geoffrey also wrote in a fashionable mode for the time. The De Gestis was written in the monumental style, uh, like that of other popular Anglo-Norman historians like Odert Vitalis and William of Poitiers. So he knew his audience and knew the kind of thing that they would expect and want to listen to or read. Um, and Geoffrey also laced his work with classical and biblical allusions. So for example, by beginning his history at Troy, um, which were very popular motifs at the time. Finally, the alluring claim to have discovered the ancient history of the British past must have made it absolutely tantalizing to those living in England and Wales, as well as an object of curiosity to wider readers. Uh, for centuries before this, countries had been tracing their origins back to Troy or to major biblical figures or synchronizing events in their history with important world events. So, for example, the Franks in the Carolingian era, so that's a couple centuries before this, and they lived in sort of the area which is modern day Germany now, um, they produced texts which claimed their origins back to Troy. Um, as did many Italian writers did via uh, the Aeneid itself. So for a long time, Britain had lacked a comparable history until the Historia Britonum came up with Brutus. But it was Geoffrey who was able to spread that story to a huge audience and therefore gain most of the credit for it. So this popularity is evident not least because the De Gestis has survived more manuscripts than any other secular text, I believe, in the medieval Latin West. It's incredibly popular. Ah, so um, in the centuries between Geoffrey's lifetime and the Tudor dynasty coming to power, Geoffrey's original work was read and recopied extensively. But vernacular translations, so that is translations into languages other than Latin, um, helped it stay relevant across these generations. So there are countless numbers of different translations, adaptations and spin-offs of Arthurian material that we could trace back to being influenced by Geoffrey, uh, which I could mention here. Um, however, to keep things brief, I'll focus on the collection of Arthurian stories written in French called the Lancelot Grail Cycle, or also the Vulgate Cycle. Um, there we go. So by the time this collection was written um, in the early 13th century, lots more material had grown around the original kernel of the De Gestis. So it was in these offshoots, for example, that the story of the Holy Grail started to emerge, which was never originally a part of Geoffrey's work. Um, one slightly later romance you might have heard of as an example is Gwen and the Green Knight, uh, which is from the 14th century. And it's just about to be adapted into a feature film. I think it's coming out this summer starring Dev Patel. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but the Vulgate cycle was different from romances like Gawain because it was written in prose. So historiographically speaking, this gave it slightly more authority compared with the broadly speaking, more fantastical verse form. And moreover, the Vulgate cycle's narrative sticks very closely to that followed in the De Gestis, so demonstrating, again, Geoffrey's text was seen as a prime model to fall back on. It hadn't really been superseded in that century after it. Um, but even as the De Gestis' story blossomed into French prose, uh, 
uh, the connection to Wales persisted. So modern scholars know today that the authorship of the Vulgate cycle is impossible to figure out for certain. We just don't know who wrote it or whether it was a series of authors. Um, but in the 13th century, so just after it was written, um, it was often attributed to a man named Walter Mapp. Uh, while Walter Mapp didn't actually write these stories, he did write a different text called the De Nugis Curialium, so that means on the trifles of the courtiers, which was a series of anecdotes and stories about life in the court of King Henry II. So in it, he tells the story of the legendary King Hurla, which is otherwise known as the Wild Hunt, which you might have heard of. Um, Walter tells us that King Hurla was an ancient king of the Britons, so the Welsh, um, who was tricked into being transported into the future along with his hunting party. And I think it's by a small dwarven king and there's all sorts of adventures they get up to at different wedding feasts and stuff. It's a really weird story. Um, but anyway, so King Hurla and his court were then cursed to never be allowed to dismount their horses after they'd been transported 200 years into the future. And therefore they haunted the Welsh countryside um, damned to stay in their steeds until Henry II was crowned. So the joke was that Henry's court roamed around so much, they essentially replaced this never stopping ghostly retinue. Um, so much like Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, in the De Nugis, uh, Walter claims to have lived in Welsh marches and that this story, the story of King Hurla, was Welsh in its origin. However, most modern scholars think the story is not actually from Wales at all, but rather it originated from somewhere on the European continent. So in short, Walter simply made up that he heard it in Wales. But why would he do something like this? Um, firstly, it shows that Walter thought it was really important to at least claim that he had authority to tell this story and that he did it by referring to his Welsh or Marcher heritage. Presumably on a basic level, this made chasing up his sources more difficult for the courtly audience in, in England. Um, but most importantly for our purposes, this implies that Geoffrey kick-started a trend where a writer would claim to be bringing an obscure story from the depths of Wales about ancient Britain to a courtly audience. Um, in modern scholarship, this trend is most often referred to as the matter of Britain, so it's kind of a common trope to talk about the ancient British past or stories from ancient Britain. Um, so this is why Walter's name was almost paradoxically attached to the Vulgate cycle, since he presented himself as an authority in such tales. So overall, this makes it clear that medieval, and as we shall see, early modern readers knew that the story of Arthur came from Wales, and that this was an important part of its afterlife up to the early modern period. Um, Geoffrey's work in Latin hadn't allied this past. Um, but accuracy to original source material, which we might prioritize as modern readers, wasn't really important at all. Simply the um, idea of authority, which came from claiming the story was Welsh or even more broadly Celtic in its origin was far more desirable. So speaking of which, um, I've mainly focused on the outward uh, English continental reception of the De Gestis. However, um, the text was also extremely popular in Wales itself, and it was translated into Welsh very soon after its original Latin circulation. Um, in fact, the Welsh word for a chronicle, or annal, Brit, um, actually derives directly from Geoffrey of Monmouth's work. Uh, it was taken from Brutus, who was the first king of Britain, according to Geoffrey, as you remember, um, and thus often appeared at the front of chronicles or historical works. Therefore, the Welsh title of the De Gestis is called Briti Brenhineth, or the History of Kings. The Briti Brenhineth became incredibly popular, and a sort of sequel work or continuation of it, um, called the Briti Tavasogion, so that's the History of the Princes, um, soon emerged, which was variously updated by different scribes to record the history of the Princes of Wales up to their own lifetime. So that was kind of standard chronically in practice for scribes to update works um, up to their own period. And um, actually, uh, given the, the talk this morning and uh, all the series of talks going on, um, there's a copy of the Brita Brunhina in the Red Book of Herogerst, which is in Jesus College's own collections. 
So you can see the beginning of it um, here, the beginning folio of it. And what's more, um, which is really funny whenever I was looking uh, it's up for this presentation, the, the cataloger, the summary cataloger for this uh, manuscript was actually fooled by Geoffrey himself. He's writing about 1852 and he still believes that, um, yes, this is, of course, this is a, a direct translation of uh, a, a book written in Old British or Britannic. Um, and modernized by Walter Archdeacon of Oxford. So Walter is the person that Geoffrey claims uh, gave him this ancient book in the British language. But yeah, it just goes to show how, how powerful this story was and how long um, it sort of stayed in currency, which is really funny. Um, but yes, so from this Welsh reception and given how it was accepted in both England and Wales um, very strongly, the most important thing to keep in mind is that Geoffrey wasn't just popular as a Celtic curiosity outside of Wales. Um, his work was fully accepted and integrated into Welsh literary culture very soon after it was published. So, or circulated more accurately. Um, so the De Gestis became a mutually understandable cultural language across England and Wales, which made it very important for the, the Tudor uh, dynasty's co-opting of its stories. So, uh, alongside all these translations and adaptations of the De Gestis, there was another important genre of literature affected by Geoffrey's work. So, in the middle of the De Gestis, um, the sorcerer Merlin breaks into pages upon pages of obscure prophecies, which he delivered to Arthur's predecessor, the usurper king Vortigern. Um, so these prophecies seem to predict that the Britons would eventually be defeated by an invading Saxon force. However, one day a new leader would allow them to rise again to reclaim their rightful throne. So this is a clear reference to an important figure in the Welsh genre of prophetic poetry, the Mab Dorogan, or the Son of Prophecy. Um, although Geoffrey was just co-opting a commonplace figure for his own purposes, the popularity of the De Gestis ended up doubling, doubling the popularity of this figure um, and helped it become known as a stereotyped Welsh trope outside of Wales. And just as a side note, prophetic poetry is often uh, associated very closely with Wales and Welsh literature as well, but as it's important to kind of note that there was a lot of English political prophecy going on, especially in the Tudor period as well. So it's not just a Welsh stereotype, this was happening on both sides of the border. Um, but it ended up becoming a stereotype because of the De Gestis in a way. Um, so if we think back to that William of Newburgh quote again, I'll just bring it up. Um, we can see how it's becoming part of this stereotype. Uh, William is actually you know, insulting uh, people for believing in this thing, because he says um, most, uh, most of the Welsh are considered to be so barbaric that they're said to be still awaiting the future coming of Arthur. Um, yes, so, uh, so after the De Gestis began to circulate, uh, the title of the Mab Dorogan was only ever attached clearly to two historical men, so even though it's a known figure, it wasn't actually attached to real people very often. Um, so these two figures who it was attached to was Owen Glendor, who rebelled against English rule in Wales from the year 1400 to 1415, and Henry Tudor himself. But in the case of Owen Glendor, however, Owen did not present himself as the Mab Dorogan. He didn't encourage this in his lifetime. Uh, rather, the title was given to him by others and only long after his death. Um, by contrast, the political prophecy and the title of Mab Dorogan was in a way essentially encouraged by the Lancastrian faction in the War of the Roses. So, um, so the Welsh poet, uh, David Namor, uh, was the first to hail Henry as a potential successor to the throne of England, just after his birth. Um, he doesn't stretch to call him a Mab Dorogan specifically, but in 1458, he composed a po uh, poem which called him a Q Irir, or the Eagle's Chick, um, when Henry was just a baby. So it's, he'd just been born at this point. Um, so this uh, was this image, specifically of the Eagle's Chick, was a common trope used in Welsh prophetic poetry 
spot as Helen Fulton notes, um, this image was first of all used by Geoffrey of Monmouth um, in the prophecies of Merlin to describe the sort of redeeming leader of the Britons. And then we can see more clearly later on in life when Henry was old enough to become a stronger contender for the throne, that prophetic poetry becomes much more clear about ambitions for him to take the throne. Um, so there's a lot of examples and um, there's a lot of poetry that I couldn't access unfortunately because of um, library restrictions, but I've got one example here um, which, which declares this is the time for a deliverance, the time for a little bull, so that's Henry, uh, to venture forth. Uh, there's a longing for Harry, there is hope for a nation. So it's very clear the sort of ambitions and the, the genre with, within which this poet is working in. Um, so finally, um, I have to find Felicity for these examples actually, I didn't know them and they're very, very exciting, but Henry Tudor demonstrates that he was well aware of these kind of claims being made about him and he used them to his advantage. So Henry actually named his firstborn son, Arthur, um, in full knowledge of all the connotations of, of, of that. And um, there's also rumors that circulate that he was originally called Owain, which is the traditional name given to this redeeming figure in Welsh prophetic poetry. I haven't really been able to ch chase up that reference properly, but that's an interesting one. Um, and then Hem uh, Henry also sent his uh, wife Elizabeth uh, to Winchester Castle whenever she was about to give birth because um, he wanted his son to be born in the castle that housed what they thought was the actual round table of the Arthurian knights. So, uh, so all, all of this kind of exemplifies that poets and writers with an eye to the political could very well co-opt the afterlife and the language of the De Gestis for their own purposes. Um, however, its use in this way marked a very important watershed in the history of Geoffrey's text. So referencing it in such important political circumstances did in a way raise the metaphorical stakes over whether it was actually true or not. Overall, by Henry Tudor's time, the relative age of Geoffrey's work had only furthered its historical acceptance. The sheer volume of romances and other spin-offs helped solidify its canonical status, um, as did the literal landscape of England. So for example, um, at Glastonbury Abbey, um, you could actually apparently visit the, the real tomb of Arthur and Guinevere um, after it had been excavated. So it was still around in the time of, of Henry Tudor. So because of this peak in its relevance and importance, it's no surprise that Henry VII maintained an interest in the De Gestis throughout his reign. However, ironically, it was this interest which ended up sparking the harshest criticism of Geoffrey's work to date. Um, so it all started when um, uh, Henry ordered an Italian intellectual, Polydore Virgil, to research and write a new history of England at the beginning of the 16th century. Uh, this work was then published as the Anglica Historia in 1534, although it probably been finished as early as 1512-13. Uh, perhaps because Polydor had not grown up in England and had very little emotional attachment to Geoffrey's work, he did not feel like he had to defend its, its questionable narrative to the death. Instead, the Anglica Historia tore apart the De Gestis and concluded that it was almost wholly made up, which, remember, it was. Um, he also totally denounced the, the, the tomb at Glastonbury and lots of other stuff attached to the De Gestis. And ironically, Henry VII didn't even live to see the publication of the Historia Anglica and the fallout of its conclusions sort of fell mostly in Henry VIII's uh, reign. So I'm just looking at the time where I'm a little bit over, but um, Polydor wasn't the exact end of the uh, use. It didn't stop people from using the De Gestis historically. So there's another chronicler, a Welsh chronicler in Henry VIII's reign, um, Els Griffith, who uh, uses it in his own chronicle well after Polydor published that. So it's more started, opened up a huge debate, which as we heard earlier, John Priest was a very vehement defender of Jeffrey's narrative. So it sparked a whole series of intellectual uh, debate and um, uh, yeah, other, other discussions about it. So, but it still had a big impact. So by the time of Elizabeth's reign, um, the historiographical landscape in England had been sh really shaken up 
um, staunch supporters of Jeffrey's version of events still remain vigilant even by her time. Um, so for example, the intellectual John Dee, who was also very proud of his Welsh heritage, staunchly defended the historical validity of the De Gestis. Um, but the, this atmosphere of fierce debate still ensured that Jeffrey's work remained a vital touchstone for Elizabethan writers and poets. So to finish, I will very quickly look at one example during Elizabeth's reign of this kind of complex atmosphere. So um, Edmund Spencer, who you hopefully have heard of, wrote The Fairy Queen, um, which was the first three books were published in 1590 and then the next three books in 1596. Um, but in the uh, in the Fairy Queen, so the, the the debates about the historical validity of the narrative really seem to seep through. Um, so in this section, this is the opening of Book Two, which kind of summarizes the De Gestis. It has a catalogue of um, the kings that appear in it and sort of summarizes it in this form. Um, but the reader is is told. Um, directed to look at empirical evidence, which they can well witness yet unto this day, um, in order to, to validate the Galfridian narrative. So it's, it's telling the reader, I think, here to look at various hills and stuff, which are evidence of uh, fights with giants, which are um, a big part of the first part of the De Gestis, Brutus and his men fight giants, which are inhabiting Britain. Um, but moreover, Brutus's story is turned directly to the important issues of Elizabeth's day. So um, in this, yes, in this slide, uh, he's also presented as a literal empire builder, that he spread his empire to the utmost shore. And then in this example, um, yes, uh, he's presented as having an imperial state. So that's in the second line from the bottom there. Um, and this is a generous interpretation of the control Brutus is said to have in the De Gestis. He rules parts of France and conquers bits of them throughout his reign. Um, but it's also really clever in making it relevant to the empire building aspirations of the time. And it also hints to the motif of translatio imperi or the movement of power. So this is the idea that power, the power of Rome never really went away. Um, but other countries inherited it. And of course, they argued and competed over who was the true Roman successor. Um, so Brutus was key to England's claim to, to be this heir of Rome. Um, however, even though this section is presented as a kind of catalogue of Britain's early kings, we have to keep in mind one crucial fact. Spencer is not writing a history, but an epic poem, one in which is particularly self-conscious and clearly allegorical. Through it, um, throughout it, Spencer claims to be telling stories of a fairyland which is fully removed from reality. He tells a series of tales with various moral lessons. So, for example, the first book tells the story of St. George and how his over eagerness to do good sometimes blinds him towards the truth or the consequences of his actions. Um, yet the very point of the Fairy Queen is to present stories which are morally enriching and worthwhile to tell because they take time and effort to unravel and understand. So the afterlife of Jeffrey's work fits really snugly into this model of reading. Even Polydor Virgil himself allowed that there were small kernels of truth in Jeffrey's text. So he still accepted the fact, for example, that Arthur was a real king. He just didn't believe a lot of what Jeffrey said about him. So in this way, by pushing the narrative of the De Gestis so clearly in The Fairy Queen, Spencer carefully balances the tensions surrounding its truthfulness. He presents the Galfridian version of events in a specific context to allow the audience to make up their own mind about how much stock they put into them. Um, and this is especially important because the poem is addressed to the fairy queen herself, which is obviously Elizabeth I. So from the beginning, there's a weird blending of fact and fiction. Um, so um, on this sweeping tour of the afterlife of Jeffrey's text, uh, I hope I've demonstrated the complex and multifaceted approaches medieval and early modern readers could have um, towards Jeffrey's work. There was a constant tension over the work's historical validity, but as we've seen, to a large extent, this question of historical accuracy didn't actually matter that much. What was of far greater import was the ways in which Jeffrey's text could be adapted, translated and transformed in engaging ways for new audiences.
And this flexibility ensured not just its survival, but its flourishing into Elizabeth's day. So thank you so much.